come from all over the nation to witness the quickest one-on-one -on -one motorsport ever devised. Championship drag racing is the unequaled American auto racing sport. It began on the streets. Two hot rods roaring away from a stop sign. To avoid the watchful eye of the police, drag racing limited its duration to two city blocks. Two blocks to determine whose car was the quickest. Young car buffs from every corner of the country joined in when drag racing left the streets and moved to abandoned airstrips. The location changed, but the distance didn't. Drag racing remained a quick event, just 1,320 feet, two city blocks. Over the years, drag racing has developed its own brand of heroes. Don the Snake Prudhomme, mean, lean, and quick. Tom the Mongoose McEwen, sly, daring, and super cool. Big Daddy Don Garlitz, the old pro, quickest and most experienced of all. Even the fair sex has success on the drag strip. Shirley Muldowney wheels a fuel digger as fast as any man. Drag racing is an open and easygoing sport. No rules against the fans mingling with the racers. Fans can buy a pit pass and watch the action up close, talk to their favorite drivers, and identify with them. It is this very closeness that has made drag racing so popular with the youth. They can belong and be an active part of their sport, even if they are only spectators. Let's meet drag racing up close and catch the flavor. Try to smell the burning rubber and nitro fumes and get the hot tip from the real die-hard racers who have spent their lives trying to go quicker and faster than anyone. No other man has done it longer and faster than the old man, Don Garlitz, who is both an innovator and a legend. The Swamp Rat came from the lowlands of Sefna, Florida, and put fear in the hearts of every competitor he faced. Fans around the country, from Pomona to Gainesville, know Big Daddy Don, and thousands of thumbs up greet his every appearance. I know there are many fans out here. has much to look back on, and his memories are his to keep in his own museum. He calls his cars Swamp Rats, and every machine displayed shows the Garlitz touch as the genius of the quarter mile, each one quicker than the last. From the early years to now, Big Daddy does it good. You know, it all started right here, Swamp Rat 1. This car was built in 1956 by my wife and I, in our little home garage over in North Tampa. And you know, I think I spent about a thousand bucks total money to build this little race car. Now that compares with today's modern car that I just finished construction, which was over $40,000 just to get it to the track. Yet this car ran for no purses whatsoever. We, we would go up to Brooksville, Florida and we would race on a weekend and if we won, we would maybe uh, get a trophy. But we had a lot of fun. It was a family affair. In the beginning, uh, when drag racing first became professional, there was only four or five guys in the total professional ranks that were touring around the United States and running in these, uh, they were just match races then. And the drag strips were uh, old airports that were used in World War II to train our fighter pilots. Big Daddy was the founding father of professional drag racing when he became one of the first quarter-mile racers to get paid for racing. Promoters couldn't wait to hire the Swamp Rat, fastest accelerating car in the world. For sure, Garlitz was the one to beat. This car, however, was the first car that ran professionally. We set the record at Brooksville, Florida in this car at uh, November the 10th, 1957 at 176 miles an hour. It's the first car over 170 miles an hour. Everybody said, phony times. You know, there's no such thing as a car can go over 170. So 
the strip started calling me up and they said, you know, what can we do to get you to come run at our place? Well, I said, it costs money. I just have a little body shop. I can't afford to tow around the country. So in 1958, Wichita Falls, Texas, paid me $450 to come race this car at their drag strip. And I thought, boy, 450 bucks, you know, that's half the cost of the car. The uh, car has an aluminum body. It had little bitty tires on the back, uh, seven inches wide. And I'll never forget when they came out with the eight inch wide slicks and we thought it was the end of the world. Today we run 17 inch wide slicks. With the decade of the 60s, drag racing became a national sport. It was an With the decade of the 60s, drag racing became a national sport. It was an exciting period when ingenuity reigned supreme. As drag racing grew in prestige, crowds grew proportionately, and modern, up-to-date racing facilities were constructed to meet the demands. Quarter-mile drag racing came of age. It is not uncommon for championship events to draw 100,000 spectators to places like Indianapolis Raceway Park, Ontario, California, or Montreal, Canada. Using exotic fuels had been banned in the early part of the 60s. But by 1964, fuel again became the key to going fast. The 200 mile per hour barrier was broken, and names like Garlitz and Prudhomme captured the headlines. Drag race drivers began to look like men from outer space. Special fireproof driving suits, full face hoods, fireproof boots and gloves were used. Today's professional drag racer has genuine affection for the pioneers of the 60s. Not all mechanical milestones are limited to the racetrack. Here, Don Prudhomme gets a first-hand look at the world's wildest street machine. This Corvette is powered by a Pratt Whitney single-stage gas turbine running on jet fuel and producing 880 horsepower with a top speed of 180 miles per hour. Built by Vince Granatelli, it took two and a half years to complete and is valued at over $550,000. Riding in this machine, is a stimulating experience. The power produced is awesome. Grenatelli preserved a bit of history with his creation. The jet engine is the same power plant used in the famous STP Indy Racer. In somewhat of a carnival atmosphere, major manufacturers of performance products set up runways at major events so that fans can walk through and see products up close and talk to experts about the use of these products. From this identification between manufacturer and enthusiast, drag racing has grown by leaps and bounds over the past 10 years. What was once a backyard hobby of hot rodders is now a multi-million dollar business benefiting the entire automotive industry. Drag Drag racing became a test bed for every type of engine part. In the future, automakers may look to the performance market to find ways of solving the problems of fuel efficiency and how to get the most from compact vehicles with smaller power plants. Sponsors also poured much needed funds in the form of sponsorship and prize money into drag racing. With something to run for, professional racers soon turned a hobby into a business and the speeds and the show got better. Products used by professional drag racers eventually find their way from racetracks to highways. Performance enthusiasts buy and use products that are race proven to increase the performance of their own personal vehicle. Don the Snake Prudhomme is the winningest driver in drag racing history. Only the great big daddy Don Garlitz is as renowned as the Snake. Prudhomme is tall, lean, and quiet. His interest in racing machines began in his father's auto shop in the early 60s. He graduated quickly to top fuel and became the terror of California drag strips. From the west, he headed east, and at the wheel of Roland Leong's Hawaiian Fueler began his climb to the top. Prudhomme has won more major event victories than any other driver, has qualified first more than anyone, and has the most consecutive world championships and the most funny car victories. 
Prudhomme has been a champion in both of the fastest classes in drag racing, top fuel and funny car. Don talks about his beginnings and the safety of drag racing. The way I got started drag racing was strictly uh, the love of the, uh, the automobile. And in those days, it was hot rods in the streets, roasters and the coupes and the 32s and so on. And, and that was a big thing. It was a big part of my life. I love cars. It just kind of went on from there. I competed against Don Garlitz for several years. It was really something in those days, competing against him and that group of racers like Tom McEwen. And I still, to this day, we still battle it out just about every week. Way back then, we competed on the streets. Yeah, that was, uh, that was the most easiest thing to do. But then, of course, they started building up in the areas, and it did get uh, quite dangerous to do on the streets because we were starting going faster and faster. We started learning about uh, rules and regulations and things like that, and safety belts and helmets. And none of us realized how dangerous it was or how dangerous it could be. We started tinkering around with all these parts and pieces and more nitro and more supercharger and more bigger blowers and better equipment. I mean, we've got, we've really got a monster on our hands right now. A lot of horsepower. From his shop in Granada Hills, California, Prudhomme runs his racing career as a business, dealing with sponsors, booking dates and major championship events across the country. The Snake strikes 45 or 50 times in a season, running both point events and match races. Considered uptight at the races, Prudhomme says he just takes his job very seriously. Setting records nearly every time his car speeds down a racetrack is definitely serious work. I think drag racing is a very, very safe sport. The amount of cars that go up and down the track week after week. Uh, it's very safe, but I'll guarantee you one thing, I would not, I would not get in that race car and travel 240, 250 miles an hour if I didn't think it was safe. Drag racing, in my opinion, my race cars are as safe as they possibly can be. The third most popular professional drag racing class is the Pro Stockers, and the winningest driver of all time is Bob Glidden. Glidden has won more world championships than any other driver in history. One of the true diehards of the sport of drag racing is Dino Don Nicholson. Dino began winning national events as far back as 1961. Proving that an old fox can win races, Nicholson still has the reflexes of a teenager. After a spectacular crash in 79, Dino Don came right back with a new Ford Mustang and went to war cutting elapsed times in the 840s over 150 miles per hour. Snoozes, loses. You've got to be quick to win a drag race, and Indiana's Bob Glidden wins a lot. Glidden has won scores at national events, tied with Prudhomme for the most major victories in a season, and has qualified number one more than any other pro stock driver. How do you capture the instant action of a sport like drag racing? The modern drag race complex depends on sophisticated equipment. Timing lights at the start and a set of lights at the finish. Action centers around the Christmas tree, a series of yellow warning lights and a green for go. If a driver leaves early, you lose. And a red foul light calls it. What's quicker than a snake? A mongoose. Tom the Mongoose McEwen is nimble enough to nip arch-rival Prudhomme. Goose, as he is known to his friends, is a product of post-war hot rodding on the streets of Los Angeles. Those are bygone days, and now racing is serious. McEwen talks about racing and safety. Yeah, I started drag racing uh, about 1950. 
53 or 54 going out to the old Santa Ana drag strip run by C.J. Hart in uh, California and go out there and watch guys race. I ended up taking my mother's car out there and, and uh, racing it a little bit and that's how I kind of got started and then just over the years I've just worked my way up from a 70 mile an hour car to 240 mile an hour car. Well, the difference between then and now in the sport, the old days used to race for trophies and just go out and everybody was friendly in lone parts and just go have a good time. And now since the professionals got involved in the money, it's changed the whole aspect of it like it does other sports. The uh, safety aspect of the sport, I've been in the sport for 25 years and never been hurt and I've been real fortunate. We've tried to learn from other people's mistakes. I think the drag racing is the safest of all the motorsports. Uh, you're in single lane, nobody's in front of you. Goose McEwen is now firmly entrenched as one of the fastest and best funny car drivers around. But his years of experience have been dotted with many types of racing machines. He is a true professional, and the fans love his daredevil style. Not every drag racing legend is a driver. There are exceptions. Hawaiian-born Roland Leong is just such an exception. Roland has earned a highly recognized reputation as a car builder, engine tuner, and all-around winning car owner. Leong and his driver, Ron Colson, do battle in the funny car wars, but that is only part of the Hawaiian story. Leong grew up in Hawaii, but for the love of racing, he left paradise to come to the mainland to compete. Eventually, Leong decided to leave the driving to someone else, and he would build the best equipment possible. Each machine built by Leong promotes his heritage. Each is called the Hawaiian. This one's a funny car, but back in the 60s, it was top fuel dragsters with a couple of very famous drivers. But every guy who has ever slipped into the seat of a Roland Leong race car knows that the Hawaiian is always ready. Professional drag racing is a nomadic sport. From the first signs of spring until late fall, crews and drivers roam the country, racing in as many as 50 events a season, day and night. There is little time for rest, and the hours are not just long, but endless, and food is nearly always out of a paper bag. When the summer sun sets, thunder and lightning fill the night as the drag racing pros go to work. Night racing seems to excite the feelings of the sport. There is an air of suspense as crews work on the lights powered by generators. Some crews have giant diesel rigs that are totally self-contained with portable shops, welding equipment, spare parts, and well-lighted working areas. Racing takes on a completely new set of driving circumstances. When the nighttime ground fog coats the windshields and goggles of the drivers, no wonder some call night racing six seconds of sheer terror. The moisture in the air makes the engines run richer and the asphalt becomes slick. Many a race driver has seen his chances for victory go up in tire smoke as excess horsepower causes the tires to break traction, sending the vehicle sideways, and at over 200 miles per hour, definitely exciting. If you think four wheels is tough, try doing two. Wild Bill Shrewsbury is the king of the wheel standards. This 1929 Ford sedan delivery wagon is Bill's latest. 
Back in the 50s, slide rule experts stated that no machine could accelerate over 140 miles per hour in a quarter mile. Three decades later, the future force, the jet-powered monsters of drag racing, threatened to break a 350 mile per hour barrier. drag racing as the instant sport, everything won or lost in 1,320 feet. Winning or losing may be decided in seconds, but learning to win and becoming a champion takes years of unending work. Drivers, car builders, and crew members must give an all-out effort in conquering the obstacles presented by so fickle a sport. like Bob Glidden, Don Garlitz, Don Prudhomme, Don Nicholson, Ron Colson, and Tom McEwen have all learned their trade. They can go quicker and faster than their competitors. Thing is for certain. The challenge of the quarter mile will never be settled. Someone will always go a millisecond quicker or a mile per hour faster. Every new year will produce newcomers to challenge and those veterans who never quit giving it their best shot.